Over the next little while, I'm hoping to share some, pers some of my perspectives, really, on how a same-day delivery offer can really drive your market share and improve customer experience. And as a vehicle for that, I'm hoping to use really the journey that Argos has been on during its transformation for the past four or five years um, as we were led to build our uh, fast-track delivery proposition. Hopefully, I'll cover off in three areas, really, that underlying case for change. What was it that drove us? to uh, make the step change in our proposition. Secondly, what did we learn along the way? Um, and really along the way of what we've got now to where we've got now, uh, the UK's largest same-day home delivery operation. And notwithstanding the absence of any crystal balls on stage, I hope to share some perspectives of where I think we'll be going next and what we need to focus on from a home delivery point of view. So I joined the Argos business at the beginning of its transformation journey, sort of four and a half, nearly five years ago now. And at the time, the business was under the stewardship of a new management team. And really, we then initiated a program to review and create a set of recommendations of how we were going to transform the business to answer what were, at the time, some fairly well-documented challenges that the Argos business had in order to create the sustainable long-term future. So, the first outcome of the review wasn't probably a surprise to many people. Argos at the time, five years ago, uh, faced some fairly material challenges. There'd been aggressive investment from online and multi-channel retailers that had ma massively elevated customer expectation and started to erode some of Argos's historic advantages that it had in its choice, value, and convenience offer. Customer preferences were shifting from stores to faster growing digital channels, and Argos's digital growth needed to step change its growth. And in terms of our offer, notwithstanding the fact that our participation was across all socioeconomic groups, our products, our prices, um, our brands, our promotions, our channels were biased to a less affluent customer. And then finally, the systems and the processes that underpinned the organization were optimized to deliver a two-cycle-a-year um, process, optimized for catalogs, not for fast-paced digital and dynamic digital retail. All of that contributed to where we were at the time, which was a challenging and pivotal moment for the business. But it wasn't all doom and gloom. We had some significant advantages that could, if used the right way, set us apart. We had broad customer reach at the time, and still today, over 70% of UK households use Argos at least once a year. We had multiple channels, all very well established, both physical and digital, with meaningful presence established online. And we had national coverage and local market presence with a fairly unique set of untraditional stores offering small space, lower cost overhead, and then a wide range of products. And then we had a supply chain that was optimized uh, for the movement of high volumes of single items end-to-end. -end. And then finally, if you bring that together, we had all of the above that we could use to address the challenge we were seeing. We had the ability to create a step change in a world that was going to rely on digital experiences increased product immediacy and a local presence to drive customer engagement. And our view at the time was that Argos might be uniquely positioned in the market to lead, but it would take a transformational response. The components and the results of the Argos transformation are well documented and ultimately led to the acquisition of Argos by the Sainsbury's Group in 2016. And it's those unique assets and capabilities that I'm hopefully going to talk through today 
that there were fundamental ingredients for us creating our fast track delivery proposition. Before I get into some of the detail, I thought it's worth just sharing a video of what the proposition actually is. Get set for new Argos fast track delivery. Now buy online and we'll deliver it the very same day, even Sunday, for only £3.95. So how did we get to the idea of fast-track delivery? What gave us the confidence that we could deliver both shareholder return and enhanced customer experience? And really, it was a combination of two things. You've got the shifting customer um, expectations, and you've got our unique assets and capabilities. That gave us the opportunity. At the time, and it's still true today, fast and convenient fulfillment was playing an increasingly important role in the purchasing decision of customers. This gave rise at the time to next day as the market standard and the proliferation in the supply of collection points. Argos at the time, if I reflect on its delivery proposition, was behind the curve. Our pricing was out of kilter with the market, we were a standard next day offer. We were an all day time slot. It was outsourced to a 3PL. Our customer communication was poor to frankly non existent along the way. And the multitude of systems that underpinned that offer led to disrupted uh, and inconsistent experiences for our customers. But if I dive into the tool set that we had to create fast track delivery, I mentioned earlier our supply chain and our fulfillment network. It was economically advantaged with scale to deliver a rapidly moving pace. We delivered at the time three and a half million single units each week across the country. I mentioned before our untraditional store network. At the time, we had about 750 of them. And if you reflect on what our Argos store looks like, it is in effect a warehouse on the high street or retail park with a sales floor attached to the front of it. What was unique about that? Well, it gave us real-time global stock position at high levels of accuracy that we could then choose to publish across any channel we wanted. We knew where every product in our network was. And our digital scale. We were at the time, and we still remain today, the third largest general merchandise website in the UK, with about 8 million unique visitors a month. Those three areas gave us reasons to believe that we could build a market-leading offer. However, it was important to understand that whilst same-day delivery would be an important part of our proposition, we didn't think it could be our only proposition. It was definitely part of it for customers. Serving customers whenever and wherever they want has been and remains today core to the overall Argos offer. So our big idea at the time for fast track delivery was to use our unique model of stores to become the core of our fulfillment operation, enabling same day delivery as a national offer, not a local specialized offer, more efficient use of stock across our estate, and really optimizing the investment between our larger stores and our smaller stores. And if I take us through our journey that we went on, the whole journey was underpinned by three key tenets. The first one was test and learn. Rather than waiting for large set piece launches, we tried what we could, we dived in, we reviewed the outcomes, we drove action, repeated the process, continually iterating and learning along the way. We were really clear up front as what do we want our symbols of change to be. Symbols of change are tremendously important if you've got a long program of change. 
the journey of trialing, launching, making sure clear that we had that clear strategy that we create and we drove momentum from the very beginning. Launching a same-day delivery operation is, no doubt, a technical challenge. But more importantly, it's a people challenge. It puts new strains on existing operations with process timings. New shifts, new people, new teams are required. All of which need to be recruited. Which brings me on to people and culture. Culture, or the way we get things done around here, is absolutely important to get right, particularly if, like us, you're building a distributed operation rather than a centralized operation. Cultural inconsistency will drive inconsistent operations. Get it right, you get it consistent, and you'll succeed. So with those three tenets, three key tenets underpinning what we did, we built our foundation. The first thing we delivered wasn't a technical change. The first thing we delivered was a role called Team Transformer. Team Transformers were um, taken out of our stores. You could call them change agents, you could call them fire starters, the number of names for these types of roles. And with our Team Transformers, they were colleagues based in our stores. The first thing we did, we took the colleague, that was the Team Transformer, and the store manager out of their store for a four-day training program. They came along assuming that they were going to get process training on how to run an effective same-day operation, which we did mention. By mention, in four days, I think we spent 40 minutes on it. The rest of the time we spent sharing the narrative of our transformation. Why were we needing to change? Why were we needing to adapt and evolve the business? In addition to the narrative, it was about providing toolkits, providing the skills for those team transformers to go back to their stores and lead change successfully. It was about creating a following, telling stories, and really the ability to help colleagues understand that whilst there were some significant changes in our business, it was all worth it. What we'd done when we sent the team transformers back to the stores was fundamentally changed where the strategy of the organization lived. We'd moved the strategy of change from being centrally led, from being a top-down strategy, to being a colleague-led strategy. And at that moment, things significantly changed from us. Because every piece of change we landed, we land over the next couple of years, we landed through those team transformers. That was the single biggest reason we were able to succeed. It drove the pace of change that we were able to achieve, uh, deliver and enabled us to bring this to life. Those team transformers continue to play a really strong role in our business today. So it was probably the best personal development program we've created ever. Many of those team transformers are now members of our management teams out in stores. And they continue to lead that test, that learn, that change-ready culture that we've got within our retail business. The second part of the foundation layer was the first technology change, which was implementing voice pick. We put voice into all of our stores to run the back of house operations. That was the precursor to understa us understanding that we're about to make the back of stores relatively complicated to where, compared to where they were in an untransformed world. It was important that we got colleagues used to that technology before we then complicated the operation, and it enabled us to put the complication into the system, not into the colleagues, keeping colleagues' roles as simple as possible. Hub and spoke. So once we'd put that foundation layer in, our hub and spoke network, which has been spoken about previously, where we connect our large stores to our smaller stores and move products between them based upon customer offer, is, well, you may not see it as such, but I'd argue that it was our first iteration of same-day delivery. It was, if you will, our MVP, our minimum viable product. In order to launch this, we needed to make a number of design decisions as to what a network would look like. Would we outsource the last mile, or would we bring it in-house? And whilst we debated this for some time, the answer in the end was relatively easy for us. For digital customers, often the only human contact with a brand is the person delivering the item. Did we want to outsource 
that window into our brand to a third party, or do we want to own that experience? We absolutely decided we want to own that experience. So we, we felt it was tremendously important for us to be able to give the customer the best window into our brand we could, or as we called it, take our store to the door. Once we decided that we were going to go in-house, it's easy for me to turn the page, it was then decisions. What fleet would we need? What fleet would we need for Hub and Spoke versus Fast Track Delivery? How long were we going to keep it? How would we stock our hub stores? We had the challenge of protecting trade on the sales floor and becoming a fulfillment hub at the same time. How do I manage the balance of both? And so we created 150 hub stores across the UK. That 150 hub stores moved stock on a daily basis, twice a day, to fixed endpoints, fixed delivery routes. That gave us a safe and stable testing ground for how to run a home delivery operation. That enabled our hub store managers to understand how to manage a team of drivers, how to manage a small fleet of vehicles, and how to balance what is now their 24-hour operation compared to a traditional store in a safe and controlled environment. It's at this point it's worth pointing out um, a great symbol of change from our test and learn strategy. So we had a situation up in Dunfermline where we had a store that was closing and relocating to a new location, but we had a trading gap in the middle because the new store wouldn't be ready in time. That trading gap in the middle was our key Christmas trading period, which none of us were particularly comfortable with. We had a home-based store at the time that had a small amount of space. So we thought, let's see what we can do with Hub & Spoke. Let's create a very small store that will hold a few lines, but not many, but use the local hub to service that customer demand on that same day basis. I'll come back to that one later. So whilst we were trialing Dunfermline, we were continuing our technical build for fast track delivery, building out the functional richness, enabling dynamic routing, enabling multiple in-day cutoffs, multiple delivery slots, colleague device enhancement, end-to-end -end customer journey mapping, defining and creating our brand execution of how we'd articulate the proposition. And it was at this point we had real things to start testing on customers in terms of prototypes. And we constantly tested and iterated with customers, really driving and tweaking our overall de development agenda. And so we get to pilot. Our pilot, having tested in a few stores, took a whole region of the UK. We focused on the southeast and the south coast of England, and we went big bang with a launch for fast track delivery. It was complete switch. If you lived in that area, that was now your standard proposition. It's the first time we had branded vehicles, uniformed colleagues, delivering the service that we believed would win. Why was that important? Well, it was important for us to understand and to infer what would a national scale launch look like. We adapted our media and our advertising. We targeted the Meridian East TV region so we could act completely like a national launch. Customers would see a real, see real difference. We could understand what the material customer behaviors would be. Would we see a change in frequency, in spend, in volume, in channel shift? We could get their feedback in real time and be able to tweak and amend our plans ready for national launch. And importantly, I'll go back to it, helped us better understand the dynamics of the operation. I go back to that balance between front of house and fulfillment hub and how I maintain availability. And from pilot to launch, so after three months of pilot, we moved to national launch. In the space of four weeks, we rolled out, sorry, 14 weeks. Four weeks would have been ambitious. 14 weeks, we rolled out to 150 hubs nationally. It was at this point, it's fair to say, our learning started at pace. Any safety net of the old propositions was removed. This was just how we did business now. And for anyone that's launched or runs a home delivery operation, you'll appreciate and you'll recognize it was a year of learning. The first Christmas, the first snow, the first understanding of growth and scale. While we'd modeled and we'd planned for all these events, you've got a year ahead of you to understand the real dynamics of this new proposition. So 
So at this point, if I come back to Dunfermline on the timeline, well, I'm pleased to say that Dunfermline was an unexpected but outstanding success. Um, customers absolutely took to the model em and embraced it. And in doing so, we blew up all of the orthodoxies as to how big an Argos store needs to be. So it wasn't originally part of our plan, but through testing and learning and experimenting, we discovered that all of a sudden we'd unlocked an enormous potential, which resulted in us building 100 concessions inside a year inside our home base locations. As we finished those 100 concessions, we'd been talking for a number of months with one of our partners, Sainsbury's, and we created 10 stores in stores, or store in stores inside supermarkets, exposing the Argos offer to levels of footfall that we'd not seen before in a very different environment. Ultimately, as you all know, it was a success for both brands. It worked really well for the Argos brand, it worked tremendously well for the Sainsbury's brand, and ultimately led to the acquisition of Home Retail Group back in 2016. Where are we now in the broadly 18 months since acquisition? Well, we are at just over 190 stores in store inside supermarkets. And we've created off the back our newest format, which is completely stockless, and we have broadly 200 collection points live. All of this change powered by our same-day delivery proposition. But we're not resting on our laurels. So we're scaling the business now, and we continue to scale the business. And we've introduced, to improve our proposition further, three regional fulfillment centers. Regional fulfillment centers are broadly 70,000 square foot warehouses, um, purely focused on customer fulfillment. It takes our range that's available for same day delivery from about 20,000 products in the average hub up to 50,000 products. It also adds in much needed capacity for same-day movement with our ever-expanding store estate. So, on to the future. We constantly look at the UK fulfillment market and looking at how it evolves, whether that's through our competitor set, what 3PLs are doing, what's happening globally. It's important that we continue to iterate, we continue to learn. And it can be very easy for every, all of us to become wildly distracted by warehouses in the sky. What are autonomous vehicles going to do next week? Et cetera, et cetera. And all of that is important to take into account, but there are probably some trends that are much closer to home, and it's the trends for me that are interesting rather than necessarily the solutions, because I think the solutions will be different for each business. So if I sort the wheat from the chaff on what are the trends that I think are important today and becoming increasingly important. Certainty and control. So customers are increasingly demanding that they're in control of their fulfillment and they get real certainty from it. That they can amend the services post-purchase based upon their convenience. It has to be underpinned by excellent customer communication. And if you just think about, um, or if you've read the IMRG report, delivery report from last year, three of the top four factors that customers cited as reasons to make orders or ways to make receiving orders more convenient were all related to tracking and order communication. And from a certainty point of view, narrower and narrower, more specific time slots together with in-the-moment tracking, will become increasingly common. Returns, an often overlooked part of the fulfillment process. And whilst advances are made on the outbound journey, customer expectation on an inbound journey is rapidly increasing at an increasing rate. If you look at the recent Royal Mail report, they said 47% of customers would not shop at a shop or a retailer, if that retailer started to charge for returns. And finally, click and collect. 
from a lower base, growth rates are going to strip home delivery, outstrip home delivery entirely. And it will lead to almost the potential trifurcation of channels with home delivery and click and collect being the winners at the cost of walk-in trade. Convenience, control, and cost resonate strongly with customers. That's true today, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. In conclusion, everything above could probably be described as a model where fulfillment enables shopping whenever, wherever, and however a customer wants. And further, it tells me that while a, same, uh, a fantastic same-day delivery proposition will be a key part of the proposition, in isolation, it's not the only answer. For me, those that will win, particularly in the UK, in the next five years, are those that have a suite of fulfillment capabilities and critically optionality to respond rapidly in this most exciting of retail markets. Thank you. I'll happily take questions. Thanks, uh, Nigel. Excellent uh, keynote start to the day. And um, I think Nicola's got a microphone roving at the back of the room. So I don't know whether we can do anything about the lights in here because <laughs> we can't see um, the audience. So you'll have to shout if you've got uh, a question. Um, just, just, start, just to get things sort of rolling, Nigel, um, great, great story in terms of the transformation from a kind of, you know, the people and culture side of things. Could you just share with us uh, what sort of impacts it's had on the, on the wider business from a logistics point of view in terms of, you know, you mentioned three, I think, three new fulfillment mm -hmm. um, operations and so on. What's it doing for the balance sheet in terms of inventory as well? Because if you're holding 50,000 sort of SKUs and you've got to make these available, you know, really close to the consumer, you know, what's it, what's it doing in the overall um, effect on the business in terms of sourcing and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the whole logistics network behind yeah. your, your part of the business? So uh, from a, if I cover the piece, what are we doing from a stock and inventory point of view? I think one of the key parts or key successes of the proposition is the fact that we're using inventory that was already out across the estate. So we have to maintain an availability level across our shops today, whether we had a home delivery operation or not. So yes, we need to put a little bit more investment in stock into our hubs, but at the same time, because we have the hub and spoke operation, we could pull back on some of our investment and stock on spokes and some of our slower moving lines, we could move back into the hub. So in the round, it balances out. Um, it's just a great way of sweating our inventory further than we were before. Great, we've got a question. Could you just give us your sort of name and day job <coughs> sort of introduction so we know uh, Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Um, Nigel, that was fantastic, thanks. Thank um, I'm Dan Upwood. I had a retail consultancy called Q5. We specialize in supporting people um, at retailers and consumer goods companies on their strategy, organizational design, and change management. So um, this is fantastically interesting and very, very current. Um, I was really interested to understand um, what changes you might have made organizationally. You talked about culture and people, mm -hmm. which was great to hear, um, very much the store managers, those people involved, etc. What did you have to do from a corporate center point of view in terms of how you operated? Because um, invariably, some of those functions can be quite siloed mm -hmm. in terms of how they operate. And, um, and a traditional logistics function might not operate necessarily in the way that you'd need it to yeah. to deliver this type of operation. Perfect. So um, you're absolutely right. It's, um, there were changes we had to make in the center. So um, there are two general ways of running a transformation. As you described it, you can have, and I, to be fair, in my experience, in my past, I've lived both. Um, you can create a function which is completely separate to the organization. Um, there's an argument that says you get a team of specialists and you can move faster if you do that, but there's a real risk you become disconnected from the rest of the business and then you've got the um, joyous process of trying to bring that back together again at some point in the future. We took an entirely different approach. So um, whilst 
me and my team, when we joined, when we created, uh, we, we came together as a collection of existing functions and new capabilities that were brought into the business. But we're absolutely embedded within the business. So with it reporting through the, the standard uh, functional structure that you'd expect within a retail organization. And that was tremendously important. It was important for the change team to feel the heartbeat and the rhythm of the underlying business. But it was equally important for the underlying business to be absolutely part of and co-creators of the strategy and the change. So we, for us, the absolute right approach was to bring it together. From a functional and from a silo point of view, um, we talk less about traditional logistics or distribution or supply chain now and talk much more about fulfillment. The reality is we're a fulfillment organization. Stores fulfill products to customers. Our home delivery operations fulfill products. Um, I suppose at its core, we've somewhat separated replenishment from fulfillment, but they all undertake and serve complementary, complementary roles. Um, but we think about it as an end-to-end. -end. So from that point of view, it absolutely, absolutely integrates. I was interested just on your slide diagram <coughs> that the dot didn't join back into the beginning of the cycle. So how, how are you managing this now, 18 months in on a continual cycle? Because that people and culture thing doesn't stop. That looked yep. like a project. Yeah. The way the slide was drawn with a kind of end date it's in mind, but it's actually a continuum, isn't it? it the, has to be. the only reason it stopped was because that's where we are today. Right. Those three key tenets underneath just underpin all the way we do business now. So continually, continually iterating, testing and learning. Next question. Yes, hi Nigel, my name is Nick Millward. I head up uh, Engage, which is a mobile engagement company in Europe. Um, we actually run part of the click and collect service for Argos Sainsbury's today. Uh, just to your point where you said click and collect will outstrip home delivery, could you just expand on that a bit, please? Yeah, so if you look, so if you look at any industry's report now, so if you look at the um, IMRG home delivery report from last year, the rate of home delivery, uh, sorry, the rate of click and collect growth is higher than home delivery, significantly higher than home delivery, albeit from a much lower base. Part of that will be proliferation of supply. If you think not just about retailers, but third party click and collect providers, expanding their number of locations. But in the main, it's because it's coming from a lower base, is what you're seeing. Another question from the floor. Yes, I'm just here. Yeah, over there, please. Hi, I'm Boris Hanoitsen, and uh, I'm especially interested in the, the actual last mile. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't mention a lot about that. How do you ensure that you deliver correctly to the uh, when you're doing home deliveries? And how do you handle uh, problems not delivering correctly or not finding the address and not repeating the mistakes? Or mm -hmm. And the workload, how do you handle it within a time frame, things like that? So um, w as part of um, our in-day process, we have uh, multiple cutoffs a day based on delivery slots that customers select. So uh, live on the website, you'll be offered slots as a customer. Those slots are only made available based on our dynamic routing, saying we've got capacity to deliver in that slot, in that postcode, with what you're looking for. So from a managing capacity point of view, we do that, we almost control that capacity on the inbound order from the customer. And only, only, we only present what we can actually fulfill, both from stock and from time. When we get into the operation in the back of the store, um, we continually pick our orders as they're coming in and we marshal them at the back and the store, uh, the customer fulfillment assistance using a handheld we've created um, will pick their items based upon their manifest that we send down to the stores three times a day um, and scan all those items on the van. So that same ePod is not just around um, product tracking, it's enabling us to do routing as well. So the dynamic routes downloaded to ePods, drivers are following those routes. There's customer communication along the way. So at the point of order, at the point of dispatch, we confirm exactly when we're coming. And then 15 to 30 minutes before the driver arrives, you get a text message as well as a customer. So driving some certainty for the customer as to when we're going to be there. Now, things happen customers may not be there. So we, we have a traditional, like you would expect for a courier operation, a leave safe um, alternative, 
depending on the business rule set and the type of products, etc. Constant monitoring of what's going on is absolutely key. So the data we get from our EPAD continuously feeds back. Um, so, and that's monitored centrally from a success point of view. If in the hopefully unlikely event we have things like a failed delivery, so maybe a customer out, it might be a road closure or something like that, which means we can't get somewhere. Um, there's a series of automated processes that kick in. So the driver bait will turn around and say, I can't get there for whatever reason, or I'm there and I can't leave safe. At that point, there's routines that run in the background that will automatically try and rebook that order for that customer. The customer has the opportunity to then change that order if they want to, if that's not convenient. But we've got various fail-safes that kick in which will try and manage that customer experience. And ultimately, we're a human-faced business. The customer can talk to somebody if they need to. Great. Yeah, there's one at the uh, back of the room on this side, please. <coughs> Thanks. Hi, um, my name's James Grolton. I'm a product manager for uh, fulfillment systems at Ocado. Um, I was interested in the software that you must have had to produce um, as part of this journey. Uh, I was kind of interested how much of it you built in-house and how much of it you kind of bought in from external parties and, and kind of what that journey was like. So um, we've got a mixture at the moment of in-house software and, um, and bought in third-party software. And we, we're going through a journey of really migrating and choosing what do we believe our core competencies to be, so what do we want to own as our products, versus where are we happy to invest and work with someone else. So the overall end-to-end -end operation is a combination of both. Um, along the way, one of the, you know, one of the big parts of the transformation was overhauling our overall technology stack. Some of that was bringing new um, tools in, new software in. Some of it was step-changing our existing implementation. Um, so, you know, sent, you know, if I take an example, centrally within our, um, our order management system, we use Sterling Commerce. Uh, we probably have now the largest implementation of Sterling Commerce in the world with the number of fulfillment endpoints that we know, or nodes that we now put as part of it. So we work very closely with specialist teams there to make sure that we're getting the right implementation. Equally, we're building our own software. So the software to run our fulfillment operations in our stores is completely in-house built. Um, it talks to the order management system, but it's completely in-house built. So it's a combination. So across both brands, Sainsbury's and Argos? Uh, it's fair to say both brands um, are, uh, have a mixture. <coughs> have a mixture. Um, there's probably a slightly more in-house at the moment within the Argos brand. We still run them as two very different, uh, very uh, individual um, system estates uh, at the moment. Certainly you know, when you're bringing businesses together, um, you tread very carefully about where you integrate from an IT point of view. Yep. Hi, I'm Ali Abdul from mattressfashion.com. I'm an e-commerce product manager. And my question was, what was the extent of your test and learn approach? Um, you said you've, you know, you've taken on an MVP, minimum viable product approach. What did that mean? Does that mean you launched maybe at one store, tested, and then got the results? Or did you launch at wide and then with minimal no. features? <coughs> uh, we launched, with, uh, the answer is probably both. Uh, we launched with one store to start with. Um, and it's fair to say, on day one, of the first implementation, I was sat cross-legged at the back of the store <coughs> routing parcels by hand um, using Google Maps. Because it, it's test and learn. When you're first trying to deploy something, um, you've just got to check it works. So we'd absolutely deployed to initial trial stores. But at the same time, it wasn't just about deploying an end state. It was about deploying the smaller pieces along the way that allowed us to test and then build upon. So that was my point around um, starting, for example, with a hub and spoke pilot. That enabled us to understand in a relatively controlled way, how would a same day operation work? How would the same day systems work within it? But our first iteration of Hub and Spoke didn't need dynamic route scheduling. It didn't need the colleague handheld to be that particularly advanced with it. So we could deploy simpler versions of our products to gain learning, gain understanding of how that functions and how colleagues, for example, interact with them. That as we then build out the functional richness, we're doing it based upon end user experience. Yes, 
Yes, we have one more on that side of the room. Uh, hi, my name's uh, Paul Benson. I represent a uh, last mile delivery company, Treadstone. Um, are you likely to use your experiences from Argos to um, provide Sainsbury's with a similar offering to customers um, in the same way that perhaps Morrison's have done? Um, we're constantly, as we bring the two businesses together, we're constantly looking at how do we drive real value out of the combined capabilities of the business. Within our food business, we already have a same, delivery, uh, same day delivery offer, both through, through our traditional grocery offer and through our chop chop um, business within the London area. But we, continually, we continue to look at how we provide complementary, I suppose, function, functionality across the group. Microphone's coming. Hi, I'm Bio. I work for Pepco Europe, the holding company of uh, Poundland. Mm -hmm. And my question is, as you have gotten better at delivering products to customers' homes, how has that affected Click and Collect? Um, our Click and Collect offer is continuing to perform the way the market's performing. As I said, the, you're seeing huge growth in Click and Collect as a market. Um, so from our point of view, um, no doubt there is some change, but the scale of growth within Click and Collect, it's, you know, there are absolutely complementary offers. And we see customers, based upon their lifestyle choices and how busy they are at times, they switch seamlessly between them. You get you know, very, very good with you know, delivering within specific time slots, same day delivery, mm -hmm. next day delivery. Do you think customers will get more comfortable with you know, with that side of things as opposed to ordering to a store? Uh, I don't think it's about customers getting comfortable, personally. I think if you think about it, um, <coughs> your life is very different on a day-by-day, week-by-week basis. So for me, the optionality of fulfillment offers is absolutely important because it's about enabling customers to shop their way. It's about enabling customers to do what's right for them in that moment of their life. So from that point of view, you have to have the suite of offers um, from a fulfillment endpoint point of view, whether that's home delivery or whether that's click and collect. So for me, they're absolutely complementary. It's not one over the other. Yeah, hello, this is Peter de Bock from uh, Nuskin in the Netherlands. I'm a transport Hi. management specialist. Um, it seems you've built up a complete logistics network for same day delivery, basically. Uh, you're able to do so because you're a big company, you've got a lot of stores all over the UK. Um, are you considering to go the next step and actually have third parties making use of your network? Um, uh -huh. We have no existing plans at the moment. But as I say, we continue to look at what's going on in the market. Uh, we've got more than enough growth and change to be able to focus on within our own organization at the moment. But who knows? Who knows? I've been facing that way. So I think we've got a question over here. Can we get a microphone over this one? We might have to make this the last one, depending on how we go, Nigel. <coughs> Hi, um, my name's Harriet. I work in the internal audit team at Selfridges. Um, so you talked obviously a lot about kind of changing your kind of key way of supplying to the customer, mm -hmm. i.e. same day delivery, um, and what that looks like. Do you think that will change the demand for the product for the customers? Um, are you looking at kind of what the product range is um, after the transformation? Yeah, I mean, we do, as part of the transformation, we absolutely changed our product range. So one of the core parts of our transformation, along with making more choice available to customers faster, which a lot of what I've talked about today was about, was about creating universal appeal. And that universal appeal wasn't just about how we were as a brand and the look and feel of our stores, it was the products we sell as well. So absolutely we reviewed what was our own brand strategy and where we were driving that, together with what brands did we want to bring in and put as part of our product sets. We're a broad church retailer. We have a huge, broad range of products. Um, I don't see us specializing that down at all based upon what we do from a home delivery point of view. It comes back to its options and choice. 
um, and very much p a core part of our transformation was trying to sell as broad a range of po uh, products as we could, but being really tactical and very um, acute about where did we sp where did we stock those products. What you don't want is you know a full sixty thousand rep uh, SKU range sitting in every single shop. Mm -hmm. Now, if you had endless working capital, you absolutely would. Nobody does. So the hub and spoke operation enables us to play tunes with where do we invest in our stock and therefore where do we place it around the network. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> conscious of time, and actually one of my um, leading KPIs today is to keep everything uh, on track. So we're going to get towards winding up. But just, Nigel, f to sort of close on, I is, it, um, is it too early yet to ask you, I mean, it's so encouraging to come to an event like this and hear the word customer coming up virtually in every sentence in every conversation uh, and that's one noticeable change from uh, many of the kind of logistics conferences of, of the past it is about this this customer at the center of everything but coming back to the business is it too early to ask you what the effect of, of this is on the business is it profitable what what effect has the transformation from your centralized model to this distributed model had on net margin in the business? <laughs> the easy question, sir. So I think if I, if I answer the first part of your question, what impact has it had on the business? Um, it's fair to say we couldn't be more pleased with how the fast track proposition and the overall hub and spoke operation has, um, has performed. That couldn't be more. And that's not just us. Internally looking at that, our customers couldn't be more pleased. So consistently with the move from um, our centralized operation to our distributed operation, um, the fast track propositions, collection and fast track delivery, are consistently the highest performing on a net promoter score basis, the highest performing channel that we have. So we love the propositions. We see fantastic growth through it. We see it's enabled a huge transformation of our business. But importantly, and probably most importantly, our customers absolutely love the propositions as well. 